everybody. We're, for those of you that will be watching, this is uh, Genesis 23. Um, there's a couple people still rolling in, so why don't we take prayer requests. Uh, Jerry will obviously pray for your situation. I hope your lungs get stronger. That's scary. Um, do any of you other fellows have any prayer requests or any other prayer items? Um, keep in mind, Opal Shively, um, I just found out today that Opal has a little spot of melanoma on her nose, and, uh, and it's cancerous, but they think they could just keep removing it, and so they're, they're going to um, do another procedure on her and to be able to whittle that away, so it doesn't seem to be anything life-threatening or anything like that. It's just uh, a spot on her nose that they're able to, to remove, so they're just keeping an eye on that. So, um, also pray for uh, Norm Blackburn. He got done with his radiation treatments. Um, so pray for him. Uh, Nancy Blackburn, has a, uh, she fell and suffered a gash in her leg, and that's slowly healing. Um, uh, Bob Keener's grandson, he had an unspoken for him. Also, uh, Chris Elholtz. You know, Clyde knows her. Um, she has to go Friday for a pancreatic appointment. She's got issues with her pancreas. So that pray for Chris Elholt. Cheryl's sick. That's why John and Cheryl aren't here. So pray for Cheryl to feel better. Um, and uh, pray for Eric's wife, Trisha. Eric Lloyd was here. And uh, Trisha's been going through some things. So pray for her. John Elliott um, had two stents put in. And he's in recovery from that. And uh, Katie's doing her Bible study over at the house tonight. So one of her girls got saved a couple weeks ago. Um, Lilia, well, hey, George. Lilania, is that how you pronounce it? Lilani. So, hey, George. That's, yeah. We, we were thinking about canceling, but I'm glad we didn't because Jerry came all the way up from Navarre. That's Roy's brother right there. So. Navarre, home of, is that Shares potato chips? I think it's Shares or, yeah, right. And then they have that um, discount uh, you know, uh, store right off the factory. And then there's a depot. There's an old train depot there I think they made into a restaurant. Have you ever been through there? Yeah, Talking about Navarre and... Because we have to be careful because people can't hear when we're going back and forth because they can hear this, but they can't hear you guys. So I've been reminded to repeat your questions because they can't hear what you guys are saying. So, so it's like when people pray on Sundays, they can't hear them pray because they did – you, did you get a chance to tune in last Sunday? If you do tune in, you'll be able to hear the difference with the sound, Jerry. You should be able to hear. Part, did you? Okay, you heard it. It's really amazing. Um, so chapter 23 of Genesis, uh, but a couple th things first. Um, I, just, I just want us to look back at something. Genesis, let's go back to Genesis 12. So we're going to be talking about uh, the death of Sarah. It, this is amazing. I didn't know this. Um, do you realize that Sarah, Abraham's wife, was the only woman in the Bible where her age is mentioned? I never, it just never dawned on me. And it, Sarah, God saw the importance of mentioning her age. Because you think of all the women in the Bible, Esther and Ruth and um, uh, Hannah and Mar Mary, yeah, <laughs> Mary. Um, uh, who else? I mean, uh, I think of Naomi and Ruth and Esther and um, Hannah. That was Samuel's mom, right? Um uh, who was John the Baptist's mom? I can't, uh, Elizabeth, thank you. Never mentioned her age. You never hear the ages mentioned. But Sarah, we're going to find out, she died at age 127. And she was, she must have kept herself healthy looking because there was two men that were interested in her. One was interested in her and Bimelech, right? When she was 90 years old. <laughs> so he thought enough of her to ask hey, can you come in with my harem? And that was when Abraham said, well, tell him you're my sister. 
You remember that? Not once but twice Abraham did that, and that showed his lack of faith because he kept telling his wife, okay, if, someone, if we get in a hard spot, tell him, uh, tell him you're my sister. And, but the last time was when she was 90, so, uh, so she died. We're going to see this in chapter 23, that she died when she was 127. So how old would that have made Abraham? Anybody? 137. George said 137. See, I'm doing well with that, Brandon, because <laughs> they can't hear your answer. So 137. So, <laughs> so um, okay, so if Sarah was 127, how old, when she died, how old would, uh, how old would Isaac have been when she died? 37. George said 37. Because she had, she had uh, Isaac when she was 90. So if you go back to the previous chapter, we were talking about how God told uh, uh, to take Isaac up, to offer him up. You ever read that? Uh, to offer up his, his only son. God called him his only son. And a lot of, it's, uh, a lot of Jewish uh, historians think that uh, Isaac would have been around the age of Christ. There's a lot of talk about that we, you know, because he would have been 37 at the age of his mother's death, at, at that age when his mother died. The previous chapter, I mean, it's within reason to think it could have been four years before that. We don't know. I think it makes perfect sense that he would have been the age Christ was, because like we talked about the last two weeks, I think it's pretty clear that the spot that Isaac went to offer him up was on Calvary, I believe that. Now, some people believe that, no, it was, uh, he was offered up on Mount Moriah, where, you remember, that was where David bought the threshing floor, and then in, in uh, Second Chronicles, we learn that Solomon built the temple in the same spot where his dad had bought the threshing floor. You remember that? It, it was clear, and I think it's Second Chronicles 3, that Solomon built the temple in the same spot that his dad bought the threshing floor. So that gives the Jews ownership of that spot, right? Who's got that spot now? Yeah, the Dome of the Rock. It was built in uh, 1692 when Omar sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> no, 1692, that's when they built that. That's 7th century. So some people say, well, where Abraham was offering up Isaac, was the same spot where David offered up, or built, bought the threshing floor, and then his son built the temple. I think there was a picture of Christ um, substitutionary sacrifice for us up on the hill to the west of the city. Remember all those pictures we showed? Uh, a hill rising up to the west of the city, and in Hebrews chapter 13, it said he was crucified outside the gate. Um, just how, like say, say if for instance the tabernacle, which probably would have been about the size of this building, wouldn't you think the rectangle of the tabernacle? And then you would have, I'm talking about the whole tabernacle, but then you'd have the, the outer sanctuary and the inner sanctuary, you'd have the holy holies and then the um, most holy place, and then you'd have the outer portion of it, and that's where the sacrifices were, right? Um, they did the sacrifices outside the, outside that sanctuary portion. So Jesus was offered outside the gate. So you can see him um, right now with a new layout of that area. Uh, Calvary was within the gates, but before he would have been outside the gates. Um, so I think that picture of Isaac being sacrificed was perfectly timed in with his age, too, because... If he's 37 in this chapter, probably there's a good likelihood he would have been around 33 years old when that occurred with his dad. What do you think of that? Sound, sounds reasonable? I think it, it makes sense. Genesis 12, real quickly. The end of chapter 12, or chapter 11, the end of chapter 11. So just a little look back. This is uh, talking about verse 26. This is Abraham's dad. Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So those are his three boys. Um, verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. 
and Haran begat Lot. Remember this about Haran? He died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. So you remember where we said that um, Lot was basically like uh, Abraham's son? Because his brother died and he took care of Lot. So then Abram, verse 29, and Nahor, that was his remaining brother, took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Michal, okay, the daughter of Haran. So where do we see here that Abram would have had his wife, where he took his wife at? Was it in Ur or was that up in Haran? based on this. Because you remember, he got the call, according to Acts, from in the land of the Chaldees, right? Ur of the Chaldees. Then he left. Okay, when did he leave? Um, verse 30, 31. And Terah took Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law his son's Abraham's wife, and they went forth from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came into Canaan, Canaan, and they came under Haran and dwelt there. So they left to go up to Haran after the boy by the same name died, right? So where do you think Abram found Sarah? Down where he was from, right? Because he didn't... But then the next chapter, chapter 12, that's where... God, you know, um, he initially got the call from God when he was there, but God reiterates a call in, in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land where I will show thee. So he's 75 years old then. So he was a little bit older when he left Ur. This was when he was already in Haran. There was some confusion on that, but it's clarified in, I think it's Acts chapter I can't remember the chapter. Maybe you can look it up where it talks about, you know, about the history of this. But the reason I bring that up is so he found his wife in his homeland. He's 75. He goes up after his brother dies, after uh, Heron dies, goes up with his family when he's 75 years old. And then uh, when his dad dies, um, let's uh, let me see where if it says that verse. Oh, here it is, verse thirty-two. And the days of Terah, remember that was Abraham's dad, were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. So when, so when his dad dies, when his brother died, that's when he went up to. And maybe you can find a map of Ur compared to Haran, something like that. When his when his brother died, that's when he went up to Haran. And then when his dad dies, that's when he goes from Haran down to Canaan. Okay? I just wanted you to put that in perspective. So let's go to uh, Genesis 22. So by the time we get to when his wife died at age 127, by the time we get to his wife dying, they had been in Canaan just keeps popping. They had been in Canaan for 62 years. 62 plus 75 is, how old was Abraham now at this time? 137, right? Abraham's 10 years older than Sarah. So they had been there 62 years, so they had been through a lot, right? A lot of stuff together on this journey. And it started in Ur, the Chaldees. Let me, wave to me when you find a, a map from Ur, the Chaldees, to Haran. Okay, so now... He gets called to sacrifice his son. He had waited from he was 75 years old till he was, how old did he have when he had Isaac? Remember? 100. 100. So he waited. I went to Falls, but 100 minus 75 is tw uh, 25, right? So <laughs> Jerry's a snow boy, so he could relate to that, right? <laughs> um, so he's 100 years old when he had this son. Okay. Look, look at God's provision. Look how much he took care of these two. All right, let's go to the end of chapter 22. This is after the sacrifice, the would-be sacrifice of Isaac, and God provided a ram in the thicket. 
And it came to pass after these things, this is Genesis 22, 20, that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she has also born children unto thy brother Nahor. So remember, he had one remaining brother. Okay, there's a... Okay, so you see Ur down there by the Tigris and Euphrates River? And then that's where he went up to Haran. Thank you, Brandon. So that's, that's a picture of the... You want to maybe close... Can you do a close-up of that for the people at home? So that's, that's where it started, down in Ur of the Chaldees. And then he went north to Haran. And when he's 75 years old, God says, okay... Get away from your family. You can't keep around. Your dad's gone. Now let's, let's go get to business here. So then, so his sister's, his sister-in-law, Milcah, starts having babies. She has also born, this is 20, uh, 2220. She has also born children unto thy brother Nahor. So these are his nephews. And two of his nephews, you know what their names were? Huz and Buzz. <laughs> See that? Huz the firstborn, and Buzz his brother. Who says the Lord doesn't have a sense of humor? Huz and Buzz, and Kemiel, the father of Aram, and Chesad, and Hazel, and Pildash, and Jitlop, and Bethel. And Bethel, now look at this in verse 23. And Bethel begat Rebekah. Remember who Rebekah was? Yes. God had already, because we're going to see later on, God willing, that Abraham's, Abraham's trying to find a, a wife for his son. God had already provided that wife way before he even started thinking about it. Isn't that great about God's provision? He had provided Rebecca well ahead of Abraham saying, as a dad, I want to help my son find a, a godly woman. And it's almost as if it was like the ram was already in the bush. Like I heard one person say it like this, that while... While Abraham and Isaac were going up one side of the mountain, that ram was walking up the other side of the mountain. And Abraham had no idea. But he went by faith because when his son says, Hey, Dad, I see the wood and the fire. I see the fire, but where's, where's the sacrifice? And he said, God will provide a lamb. I love that verse because that's a calming thing for a dad to say. Just a beautiful passage. So well before Abraham is wanting to find a son or a wife for his son. His sister-in-law begat uh, Rebecca uh, through her. That would have been her uh, grandson, right? Um, it was one of her boys' his kids. Milka's a boy, Bethel, begat Rebecca. And these eight did, or these eight Michal did bear to Nahor, uh, Abram's brother. So God had already provided a wife for Rebecca or for Isaac way before we're going to see that. So let's get to chapter 23. I just want to give that as a precursor. So God's already working behind the scenes as he's done. They've been together 62 years old and she dies when she's 127. And the only woman in the Bible that her age is mentioned, which I've been studying the Bible my whole life and that's the first time. It, did, did anybody know that? Make me feel better. I mean, I couldn't believe that. The, the only woman that her age is mentioned. Verse 2, Sarah, this is chapter 23, died in Kirjath Ar Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. Maybe, Brandon, since you did so brilliantly on that, find a map of um, Abraham living in Hebron. So Hebron was about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. Um, and Abram came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So... There's some interest here with this verse. It's like, wait a minute, wasn't he with her? But do you remember last week and the previous weeks we said that Abraham was living where? Does anybody remember? It's the southernmost point of the promised land. You got Dan to Beersheba. George said Beersheba. <laughs> he was living there, but his wife is up in Hebron. So some say maybe it was because of... Uh, Abraham was, you know, in the land, and God wanted him to uh, uh, per peruse the land that he had given him, that he was away tending to a flock, and he wasn't there. We're not sure. But he says, he came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Verse 3, and Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth. Now, these would have been the Hittites. I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. 
give me a possession of a burying place with you that I might bury my dead out of my sight. The interesting thing about this, I think there's how many verses in this chapter? 20? 20 verses in this chapter, and there's only two that talk about Sarah dying. Is that saying that God was unsympathetic towards this patriarchal woman passing away? No, or matriarch. Because what did he do when he saw Lazarus? Remember that? He, he wept. So it wasn't that. But the, the more important message is in, in this passage other than her dying. It was to him, for him to take possession of this land because, interesting enough, the laying of Sarah in the tomb is the real occupation beginning of the land. Because before that, Abraham didn't really have a place to rest his head. So we're going to see that. So, so she dies, and he goes to this area called Hebron. Let me know if you find something. <laughs> You're better than that. Come on. <laughs> map of, <laughs> you, did you find it already? Just map of, uh, what would you say? Hebron, Jerusalem, and Abraham's time. I'm giving him a hard time. So he says, I'm a stranger and sojourner with you. Isn't that true of us believers? This world isn't our home, right? It's not our home. Give me a possession of a bearing place with you that I might bury my dead out of my sight. Now, he's not just saying, Sarah, he says, bury my dead. He's thinking about his whole family down the road. Because when a husband uh, gets a burial plot, he doesn't just say, well, can you give me one little cozy spot underneath the tree? He's thinking about his wife, too, I, I'm a, right? Most people will buy. So that's what he's thinking. He's saying, i got to prepare for this for my whole family. Um, bury my dead out of my sight because no one no one likes to be around that I mean I remember my mom died at the home and I uh, that was June 22nd of 2020 and I didn't want to see her because I saw my dad oh you find it okay uh, yeah see Jerusalem and there's Hebron and then Beersheba's all the way, thanks, Brandon. Beersheba's all, it's a, you know, it's an arid area. So, so he goes up to Hebron to bury his wife, and he says that I want her out of my sight. And when my mom died, I didn't want to see her after she died. I refused, I didn't want to, because I didn't want that to be my last picture of my mom. I just, I loved her so much, I didn't want to, see, my sisters were both in there, and I said, I can't do it this time. I just don't want to have that image. I, I'm sorry, but that just I just didn't want to do it. So he says, I want to bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. So Abraham's reputation had grown since he had come into this land, right? Where people had heard about how he chased those kings down and rescued Lot and all the different things he had gained, attained. And he says, Thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of sepulchers, in our sepulchers, Bury thy dead. And it's interesting, it, it, was, it was pretty humble of, of uh, Abraham to even ask for the land because let's, let's go back to Genesis 15, verse 18. And I would have you guys read, but they can't hear you on this, so I have to be selfish and read this. Uh, Genesis 15, 18. And this is God reiterating his promise to Abraham. In the same day, Genesis 15, 18, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadamites and the Hittites, there's the, where he was going to, to visit them, and the Perizzites and the Rephrams, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gerashites and the Jebusites. So he's buying land from basically where God had already given him ownership of. He already had ownership of it in God's eyes. So let's go back to chapter 23. So, so he's talking to the, the, to the, the, the Hittites, which were, are referred to as the children of Heth. And it says in verse 7, Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth, and he communed with them, saying, if it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephraim, the son of Zohar. So he was the one that had the sepulcher that Abraham was interested in. But in this, in, in the Middle East, 
at this time, their tradition was to have a secondary person go to the primary landowner. That's how they did business. So they said, go to, on my behalf to Ephron and ask him if it's for sale, okay? Verse 9, that the, what he's wanting to ask uh, of Ephron is that he, verse 9, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he has said, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is, it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a bearing place among you. Verse 10, and Ephraim dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephraim the Hittite, their Hittites, answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in the gate of his city, saying, now, the important of this, this statement here is there was witnesses. So what we're going to see here is this is Abraham stepping out in faith because when he had heard what was going back at Haran, he had heard that his sister-in-law is bearing these children. And now his wife just died. What is our first inclination when we lose a loved one? A lot of times we want to go back home, right? Like his family was up in Haran. And the first thing a lot of us think about, let's go back home and be around our loved ones. But God put it on his heart that this was where you're supposed to be. You're just a sojourner in this land, but I'm going to give you this as a possession. So this is a very pivotal point in Abraham's life that he could have said, you know what, I'm going to scrap everything and I'm going back home. But he knew that God had made a promise and he knew that God was true to the promise. So he's saying, I'm not going to go back up north and go to Haran and maybe find another wife up there. I'm, God had called me down here and he's, he's, he's fulfilled all of his promises and I'm going to trust him. So by willing to buy this property, he had finally bought into God's program. You see what I'm saying? That he could have just said, I'm going to cut my losses and leave. But you know what? He had gotten in deep with the Lord and says, you know what? I'm going to stake my claim here. Because remember, even though he had been in this land for 62 years, he had ownership of nothing, really, by rights. So now we see witnesses to this effect. He says, we're going to do this, verse 10, in the audience of the children of Heth, even all that went in at the gate of his city. So you guys know from studying the Bible, where was most of the activity in the city? The right. We see that all the time. We saw that when, um, uh, when Naomi was asking Ruth to be able to find a kinsman redeemer for her, and that was discussed at the gate. Remember the one man decided not to take upon uh, Ruth, but Boaz did. And then remember, Clyde, we saw um, a lot was at the gates. Remember that? We saw that in chapter 19. And he was doing business out there in the gate. That was all, where all their concourse took place. Um, so every, all the activity was there. So look at verse 11. Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein. So they say in, that, in those days, out of a courtesy, they would offer it up for free. So he starts it off, I want, to buy this, I want to buy this cave. And they say, nay, we'll just give it to you. Nay, my Lord, hear me, verse 11, the field give I thee. And they say that was, tr that was the way they did their business back then in the Middle East. And he says, I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people, give, it, give it, I it thee. Bury thy dead. Now, can you see why it was important for him to buy that land? Because if he had possession of it, it could, and a clear possession of it in witnesses, it can never be disputed, right? That land can never be disputed again because, because Abraham bought that. And that was a part of God's plan. And that was a part of, you know, he was reluctant to serve God before because he didn't leave Ur of the Chaldees until his brother died. He didn't leave Haran until his dad died. He was a kind of, you know, guy like a lot of us, you have to be kind of pushed but now he's saying, I'm all in. I'm not going to go back up home. I'm going to buy this land. Uh, verse 12, Abraham bowed down himself. So he's very rever reverential, uh, rever reverential. Is that right? And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of land, and he spake unto Ephron, that's the one that owned this, in the audience, there's the, there's the witnesses of the people of land, saying, but if thou will give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give me the money for the field. So the first, you, you ever watch that show called um, uh, Stor, uh, Storage Wars where they bid on the storage units? 
So, you, so, yeah, so, you, so the, the, what they would do back then in the Middle East is uh, someone out of courtesy would say, well, let me just give this to you. And then in, in respect, the person that was the would-be purchaser would say, well, let me give you the money that it's worth, I pray thee, verse, uh, verse 13. I will give thee the money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And in verse 14, And Epton answered Aram, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? So he's basically saying, how could he turn down that offer when this guy was nice enough to offer it to him for free? Right? <laughs> it would be pretty rude to say, well, how dare you uh, put a price tag on 400 shekels of silver when he was kind enough to offer it for free. But that's just how they did their bickering back then. Um, and then uh, he says, bury the dead. You know, uh, um, 400 shekels of silver, what's that between you and me? In other words, they knew that he could spend that. Verse 16, and Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the, in the audience of the son of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with a merchant. And the field of Ephron, which was in Mechpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in the borders round about were made sure under, unto Abraham for possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of a city. See how this was documented and clearly stated? So that, say for instance, if he would have taken the offer that I'll have it for free. That land could have never been truly said that it was Abraham's and the Jewish people as an inheritance. And the great thing what it became to the people of God was a place that they could always go back to. Because you remember when Jacob was dying in Egypt, what did he tell his sons that he wanted? To be buried there, right. So this was God's first, let me restate that. This was Abraham's first foray into taking possession of the land. But it's interesting that he didn't begin to take possession of it until there was a death. Excuse me, all right? Okay. Let me, let me know if everything's okay. Okay. Um, so... It was only until, but isn't that a, a picture that he took possession of it only after there was a death? It's almost a picture of us taking possession of eternal life upon death. But that grave became a source of promise to all the ones that came behind him because Isaac was buried there. Um, Rebecca was buried there. Jacob was buried there. Um, I think there were six altogether. I think I'm missing one. Yeah. Leah, thank you. Thank you. Leah was buried there. So that's what George said. So you're right. So this became a, 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 a source of hope for the people of Israel, for the Jewish people. So let me finish the chapter. We've got one more verse. And the feet, oh wait, well, we are, I already read that part. But the, the interesting thing, too, is he bought not only the cave, but the field. And that was important because the field spoke to, to ownership more so than just the cave. That they, it was said that if he just bought the cave, it wouldn't have been the same thing as the land, the, the land itself. So, um, but it, it became, a, it was a great witness to Abraham's faith because he could have said, you know what? I've lost my wife. I've been with her all these years. We've been on this sojourn together for almost 70 years. I'm just going to go back home. But you know what? God, he, he had understood God's faithfulness, and he was honoring God's faithfulness and saying, I'm going to continue this journey. Let's close with Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And, and see, I, I really believe that God wants to see how sold out we are before he could truly bless us. You remember that when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac and God, the angel of the Lord, stepped in and said, don't do it. And then God said, I wanted to see if you were willing to do this, and I wanted to see where your heart was. And when he saw where his heart was, he provided a ram, right? Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, and we'll close with this. This is the famous Hall of Faith chapter. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, 
but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of, the, of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So do you remember when Abraham went to those men and said, I am a sojourner? And it was, he, he had no place to lay his head, basically. But finally, after Sarah dies, that was another test for Abraham to say, you know what, I'm going to stake my claim in the land that you've called me to, Lord. I'm not going to go back to Haran. Verse 14 of Hebrews 11. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out of, think of that, that was Ur the Chaldees and Haran for Abraham, if they had been mindful of that country, they might have an opportunity to return. You see the parallel there? He, if he was not a person that was at a point of his Christian, uh, of his walk with God, that he wasn't tied in to his faith, he would have been tempted to go back home. He said they might have had an opportunity to return, verse 15, but now they, have, they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Wow. So what a great picture with Abraham turning the corner and saying that I'm going to stake my claim here and I'm not going to take this for free. I'm going to buy this land. And that became, just like the empty grave is a source of joy to us, that grave site became a source of joy for that family because they could bury, they could bury these patriarchs and matriarchs there. So, all right, we'll go ahead and close and we'll have questions maybe. Does anybody have any questions on there? So um, let's go ahead and close the prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Give those safety that are out there driving. Thank you for these that came out. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So good night on Facebook Live. Um, does anybody have any questions at all?